Well, good morning. It's a good Friday. I hope you've had a great week this week. I'm looking forward to a, a good weekend. Uh, hot because it's Mississippi, but, um, you know, it's going to be good. So I hope you've had a great week as we have uh, really spent some time this week in one of the, to me, more interesting chapters in all the Bible, um, Peter and Cornelius and what happens with the Gentiles in, in Caesarea, just a really pivotal and fun and cool chapter to me to talk about. So anyway, today we're going to pick up a chapter 11 and see kind of uh, <laughs> the old if you're old like me, you remember Paul Harvey, he used to always tell, be on the radio and tell the stories, and now for the rest of the story. So now let's see what happens to Peter as he comes back to Jerusalem. So now Peter's going to go back from working with the Gentiles and um, give a report to the church. So let's pick up with eleven, chapter 11, verse 1. Now the apostles and believers who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the word of God. So Peter went to Jerusalem. The circumcised believers criticized him, saying, Why do you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? Then Peter began to explain it to them, step by step, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. There was something like a large sheet coming down from heaven, being lowered at its four corners, and it came close to me. As I looked closely, I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, and birds of the air. I also heard a voice saying to me, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I replied, By no means, Lord, for, I, for nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a second time, the voice answered from heaven, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times. Then everything was pulled up into heaven. At this very moment, three men sent from Caesarea arrived at the house where we were. The spirit told me to go with them and to make no distinction between them and us. The six brothers also accompanied me and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen the angel standing at his house saying, send a Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will give you a message by which you and your entire family will be saved. Your entire household will be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as it had upon us in the beginning. And I remember the word of the Lord, how he had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If God gave them the same gift he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? When they heard this, they were silenced. They praised God saying, then God has even given the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. One of the um, patterns you're going to see throughout Acts, and you've, you've already seen it some, but you're going to continue to see it. Um, Peter almost gives a blow-by-blow -blow recap of what just happened in chapter 10. Like, in many ways, chapter 11 is a recap or a retelling of chapter 10. You're going to see this with Paul. You're going to, we're going to read Paul several times throughout Acts, um, give his testimony of what happened in Acts um, chapter 9 when he had his Damascus Road experience. And so um, Peter recounts everything that happened. He recounts his vision that he had on the roof. He recounts Simon and Simon's, I'm sorry, um, uh, Cornelius. He recounts Cornelius's vision and what he saw. And then he recounts what happened when he preached and the spirit fell. And it's interesting. He didn't say the spirit fell because of any great thing he had done, did he? He didn't say, you know, and I preached a sermon and they accepted Jesus, but he said, well, he's preaching the spirit fell. So God was orchestrating this entire thing. This was not some great act by Peter necessarily. Peter, when you read this, when you read Peter's account, it almost sounds like Peter was along for the ride, doesn't it? I mean, it doesn't sound like Peter was really orchestrating any of this. God gives Peter a vision. God gives Cornelius a vision. They come together. The spirit falls. The Gentiles are saved. And so we see Peter saying, God was at work at this. And I love, I love what he says here. It's in verse 17. If God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? That sounds like the... Um, Almost like the um, the Pharisee who said, if this move is not of God, it will die away like all the others have. But if it is of God, we may be fighting against God himself. So Peter says, if I have gone to these Gentiles and preached, and in my preaching, they received this, it happened, he said, I love what he said, he said, God gave them the same gift he gave us when we believed the Lord Jesus Christ. He's basically saying, guys, this was like Pentecost again. 
This was like just what happened to us. Just like we were praying. And the spirit fell. Just like we were gathered together and the spirit fell. The same thing happened to them. I was there. I was preaching and the spirit fell. And so who am I? Who am I to say what God can't do? Who am I to say who God can't save? So he comes, but he comes back to Jerusalem. He's being criticized. Because he has, he has broken the Levitical law by associating with these Gentiles. He says here, he said, he said it earlier in uh, chapter 10. He said, yeah, um, you yourselves know, this is verse 20, this is 10, verse 20, 28. You yourselves know that it's unlawful for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone profane or unclean. So in the eyes of these believers in, in um, Jerusalem, Peter done something wrong. He stepped outside of the law. So and what's interesting, do, do, do you see how do you see how Peter was struggling with the same thing the Pharisees struggled with? Because I think as I've shared with you before, the Pharisees are not bad folks. The Pharisees Pharisees so wanted to keep the law of God. They so wanted to keep the law of God that they created their own layers of laws to make sure they were doing it right. So the Pharisees were misguided, but they weren't bad. They just, they wanted to make sure they were keeping God's law because they were so afraid of breaking God's law that they created this buffer zone of additional laws that they were afraid to break because if they broke, broke these buffers, then they would eventually break the law. The church here struggling with the same thing. Like, we want to be obedient to God. We want to, we want to know that we're doing the right thing. We want to make sure we're doing the right thing. We don't want to be led astray. We want to do the right thing. So they began to say, but so we can't we can't step outside of this. And by the way, if we were to keep reading after Acts to where we get to Galatians, you know what we're going to see there? Peter also struggling with this. Because here we see Peter doing this very thing. But whenever Peter uh, gets uh, into Galatians, Paul has to kind of call him out because Peter had fallen back into some of the same old traps, y'all. It's so easy, y'all. So easy after a mountaintop experience. It's so easy after we've had a revival. So easy after we've experienced the movement of God to be on a spiritual high and say, oh, we're never, I'm never going to go back to what I was doing before. I'm never going to go back to the old ways or I'm, I'm new and, and you are. Y'all, they're called ruts for a reason. And it's so easy for us to return to them. It's so easy for us to get stuck in them. It's so easy for us to just return to what we've always done, what we've always known, and just to be comfortable with what where we are and what we do. So sometimes, I really believe that, y'all. I really believe that's why God sometimes calls us to do things that we don't want to do. And to go places we don't want to go. And to love people we don't want to leave. Love people we don't want to love. Because if we only live our faith in the places that make us comfortable, if our faith only leads us to be comfortable, then it will never be dependent upon God. It will always be dependent upon our strength. And our ability and what we know and what we do and what we like. Peter was totally, totally out of his comfort zone. And God used him. And we're going to see later in scripture, Peter kind of fall back into it. So let's um let's step outside our comfort zone today, y'all. This weekend, let's step outside our comfort zone. Let's push the new things for God. Let's uh, be faithful in new ways. Let's be courageous in new ways. Let's step outside our comfort zone. And then, friends, if we right now find ourselves in our comfort zone, it's a new day. Never be afraid to step outside of it. As scary as it may be, 
as much as you may not want to, as much as it may make you afraid, as, as much as you don't know what to do. Let's, let's step outside our comfort zone. And if we find ourselves in our comfort zone, let's push through. Let's seek a new day. Let's live boldly and passionately for Jesus. So be faithful. No matter where he's calling you this weekend, be faithful. Hey, thanks for uh, joining us today. And I look forward to picking back up with you Wednesday. I'm sorry, uh, next Monday, uh, when we're going to see what happens next in the life of the church. Thanks for, uh, thanks for being with us.